Hello and welcome to uh, CNET 121. This will be a combined recording of the remaining modules since they are small. Made more sense to do it all in one shot. Module 10 covers briefly mobile applications. Uh, the first two things that are that need to be covered is what is static and dynamic analysis. Uh, static analysis will be looking at the application and its files without actually running it, whereas dynamic is actually running it. During an application installation, typically a SQLite database will be created. This is a relational database comprised of tables that may or may not be encrypted with the user's contacts, communication with contacts, and so forth. These databases contain extraordinary amount of PII and can put an individual at risk for social engineering. These can also be subpoenaed by a third party service provider for evidence. Here is a SQL where the SQLite database is for Tinder when doing static analysis. Like I said, SQLite is the preferred storage for mobile applications. The picture below shows what's associated with Tinder. Databases can have anywhere from five to a hundred tables. And with each SQLite file, you'll find all kinds of more files like database files, picture files, text files, and so forth. In iOS, the library folder is where you will find all the important user data like the cache, the cookies, and so on. In preferences, you may find usernames and passwords stored in plain text. In this picture, we see the name com.cartify.tinder as the bundle ID or the uniform type identifier made of alphanumeric characters to identify an application. So this is one way of performing static analysis. We're not running the application. We're looking at the files and the folders associated with this application. Another form of static analysis is code review. In Android, there is a manifest file, it's actually called manif Android manifest.xml, which shows the permissions associated with a particular application. For example, it'll show things like the course or the find location. It'll show any network providers, GPS information, and so on as shown here. This is for a a version 2.12 of WhatsApp. With Android, there is a tool called dex to jar which will turn an application from an Android app into Java in order to be able to be read and compiled and worked on. Dynamic analysis is looking at a application being executed. So for example, uh, running an application in a emulator, like an iOS emulator or an Android emulator like Jenny Motion, uh, and seeing what packets come in and out of that application. Continuing to harp on Tinder and how uh, we can dig in, Tinder allows deep linking, a way to connect social media accounts within its application. Using a tool called, called RobText, you can map out all the domains that are associated with it and therefore be able to track where user data is being stored, determine jurisdiction, and be able to get the appropriate subpoenas. So for example, uh, being able to grab from, uh, from Wireshark that, hey, uh, the host, here's, it's an iPhone, uh, what uh, the message, and being able to recreate what, uh, what's happening. 
An examination of the SQLite database can even bring out other users in close proximity, as this column shows from that SQLite database. You can also get even more precise information about users. Pretty crazy the amount of information that is being stored in these applications that again can provide useful evidence uh, for a subpoena for a case. Module number 11 talks a little bit about photographs. Since photos are more pervasive than ever before and are used more frequently in the courtroom, they are used to capture wanted criminals and convict criminal suspects. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children uh, is important to note because photographic evidence is of utmost importance in child exploitation cases. This organization and others maintain huge databases of hashed images of exploited children in hopes that they will assist in rescuing missing children and prosecute pedophiles. Law enforcement can use a hash of a photo and share information without having to view the disturbing image. This is that thing that uh, everybody was freaking out about Apple and being able to uh, look at your, your uh, pictures on your iPhone or iPad uh, and then send that information up to law enforcement if they detect it. Well, it's, it's exactly this. It's looking at those photos, running a hash of them and sending up that hash to a database and going, is this picture uh, in, the, is the hash of this picture found in one of these databases? And if so, let's take the next step which in and of itself, the idea is good. The execution, not so much, because you know, we're crossing that privacy line, um, but still, finding, finding pedophiles, finding uh, people who are exploiting children through the photographs that they take is a, it works. Project Vic, is a collaboration between domestic and international law enforcement and private sector partners with the same goal of rescuing child abuse victims, apprehending sex offenders, and securing crime scenes. Project Vic also has a database of child abuse photo hashes that is shared. Uh, many forensics tools can connect to Project Vic to quickly identify victims using photo DNA and contribute to an existing database. Again, allowing the law enforcement officer or the forensic investigator to not actually see the photo, but just going by the hashes alone, seeing a match on the database and saying, yes, this picture is here. Uh, three case studies that I just wanna to bring to your attention. Uh, a Facebook selfie, Cheyenne Rose, and Tuan, a 21-year-old Canadian, pled guilty to killing her friend, Brittany Gargle, in March 2015. A belt found near the teenager's body was a match with the same belt worn by, uh, by Rose in a selfie posted on Facebook just hours before the murder. The belt was used to strangle her, and she was sentenced to seven years in prison. A second one, a second case study, a CNN report in March 2017 by Homeland Security described how a predator took photos of his deplorable acts with a child in a bathroom. Using advanced technology, the special agent was able to manage to identify a prescription medication bottle in one of the photos, identify the first name and two letters, uh, along with the first three digits of the prescription number and some fingerprints. The evidence was ultimately key in putting Stephen Keaton behind bars for 110 years and resulting in 14 victims being rescued. Uh, with extortion, sexually explicit images are often used to manipulate victims or extort money with states like ours, 
instituting a bill banning revenge porn, which states that anyone who posts naked pictures with the intent to harass or annoy will face six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine. So with digital photography, you know, photos uh, are taken with a camera and stored it as a computer file. Can be stored on pretty much anything from internal memory, SD cards, compact flash. Typically the file system is FAT or XFAT. The, and that's important because permissions. Uh, the design rule for camera file system or DCF was developed by uh, JEDIA to facilitate the exchange of images between digital still cameras and other devices for viewing photos. The digital camera images or DCIM is the root directory of a file system for a digital camera and is the standard protocol. Social media websites and smart devices that run social media applications can act as huge repositories of photo images, which can be incriminating. Uh, for example, Facebook in 2011 was able to identify 18 billion faces across its API and applications. Uh, on average at the time, it was uploading 100 billion photos and 350 million uh, daily. Flickr is another place that stores billions of photos. Instagram, of course, is the same. Uh, Snapchat had made a, a false privacy and security claim to the FTC. From a forensic standpoint, images taken are still present on the user's device even after uploading. Exchangeable image file format, or EXIF, is the metadata associated with digital pictures and is used by most smart devices. It contains data such as the date, the time, the make and model of the camera, the thumbnail, the aperture, the shutter speed, and other camera settings, along with longitude and latitude. EXIF data can be manipulated, so don't put your whole, don't, don't depend on that as a solid information. You need to verify the integrity of the photograph. Now there are different file types. Uh, there's two main actually, when it comes to pictures, the raster graphic and the vector graphic. A raster graphic consists of a grid of pixels, which is the smallest element of a raster image. And that could be a square or a dot. And it's associated with pictures found on a computer or retrieved from a digital camera. A megapixel is a million pixels. Compression algorithms are used to reduce the size of large images. So file formats like JPEG, RAW, BMP, PNG, GIF, TIFF are all raster graphic extensions. JPEG is popular because of its compression and support for so many different colors is a lossy format, which means compression can cause some loss of quality to the image. It has one or more thumbnails embedded that can be carved. You typically will find BMP with Windows. PNG is a lossless uh, format and is used often in the internet. GIF is also lossless. Uh, and has data compression. In Windows systems, you will normally find thumbnails to all pictures seen in a file, in a file called thumbcache.db that is usually hiding in the users folder in app data, local, Microsoft, Windows, Explorer. It's pretty dug in there, but you can get to it. The other file type is a vector graphic that is comprised of curves, lines, or shapes based on mathematical formula rather than pixels. So formats like AI, EPS, SVG are all examples of vector graphics that are made by curves, lines, or shapes based on math.
So here's an example of vector and raster. Now this is uh, interesting. There are, there is an article X of the federal rules of evidence that relates to photographs. In it, it says original photos must be used, but in the absence a duplicate can be used if it's deemed a genuine copy or one that is unaltered. A printout or other output readable by sight is regarded as an original. Comparing photographic images can be important to see if someone was using photos without consent of the owner or prove that a suspect was distributing illicit photos. The funny thing about digital photos is they lend themselves to all kinds of techniques to improve the clarity from brightness adjustment, cropping, color balancing, contract adjustment, linear filtering, restoration in this case, or more. This person tried to hide their identity by altering the image. A computer was able to reverse most of the picture, reverse it enough that Interpol was able to find and capture this criminal 11 days after they got the picture and ran it through a computer and got it uh, set back like this. Digital photos are a pretty funny thing. Once again, a quick look into the Apple system, the Apple environment. Nothing too deep, but just, just a little overall on how it works. Again, if you are a lab whose clients are various companies, you're going to need to have everything under the sun. That also includes Mac systems, because you never know what company is using ancient Macs that you may need to do an investigation on. To that point, uh, feel free to research the old days of Mac from Apple One through their transformation to OS X. Again, being well-versed in the Apple ecosystem is important if you will be dealing with this lifestyle in the field. Apple used to have a Mac server that's been discontinued for a number of years, has had the iPod since 2001, the iPhone since 2007, the iPad and Pro since 2010, the Apple Watch in 2015, uh, along with like Apple TV in 2007, Airport Express and Extreme and Airport Time Capsules. All these things would need to be under your belt if you want to uh, be specialized in all things Apple. The Mac file system has been around as a flat file system in 84. That Macintosh file system was replaced by HFS, the hierarchical file system, when Mac OS X was updated with Unix. Max is able to read NTFS, FAT, and EXT file systems since they all share a common base. The hierarchical file system has two parts the data fork, which consisted of the data, and the resource fork, which stored file metadata and associated application information, very similar to NTFS's alternate data stream. The resource fork uh, ended up deprecated as any file copied to another file system would become a hidden file or simply removed since it's missing the metadata. HFS had a maximum of 65,536 blocks per volume, with each block being 512 bytes. HFS Plus, or the Mac OS Extended, came to life in 98. It had a maximum block size 
uh, two to the 32 power over 4 million. More blocks means less wasted space on a volume. Uh, long file names can contain up to 255 Unicode characters. It is case sensitive. Thus, a Mac should examine a Mac to prevent the loss of valuable uh, information and metadata. An allocation block number is a 32-bit number that defines an allocation block. Volume headers have information about the volume, the time and date of its creation, and the number of files stored. The alternate volume header is a copy of the volume header and is stored in the last 1,024 bytes of the volume. A catalog file contains the metadata structured as a B tree, and the catalog ID is a unique sequential number that is created with a new file. When a file is deleted, that number is not repeated again. So with HFS Plus, it is possible to keep track of how many files in total were made on a volume. APFS, the Apple file system, is a 64-bit file system with a theoretical 2 to the 64 addressable blocks or 9 quintillion addressable objects or files. Timestamps are stored in nanoseconds. APFS uses copy on write feature. When data is duplicated with a container regardless of the volume, the data content is not replicated and only metadata is duplicated. This means that two files will have data content that is physically stored in the same block. APFS also has strong encryption, which includes full disk encryption with a single or multi-key encryption. Depending on the hardware, APFS uses AES XTS, or AES-CBC encryption. Key bags, a term for Apple's stuff, stores encryption information, including the keys to unlock a container. A container key bag holds those volume key bags and the volume encryption key, a file system key, is used to encrypt data blocks. Volume key bags contain key encryption keys that are derived from each user's password on the system and the recovery key. The key encryption key is critical to decrypting a volume. An examiner needs a user's password or the recovery key in order to open the volume key bag or the uh, volume encryption key. This is how Apple has layered upon layered the, the full disk encryption. iOS uses backup, device, escrow, iCloud backup, and user. When the user enters their password, the NS file protection complete key is loaded from the user key bag and is unwrapped. The backup key bag is generated when iTunes creates an encrypted backup. The escrow key bag is used for mobile device management and syncing. Since 2017, Mac devices have a T2 security chip, which has efficable storage for some encryption information and a cryptographic engine to conduct hardware-enabled operations. There are inaccessible keys stored on the chip, which requires interfacing with it to acquire decrypted information. And if that is not enough, APFS also introduced this thing called space sharing, which allows multiple file systems to share the same underlying free space on a physical volume. APFS volumes, or 
containers, can grow and shrink without being repartitioned. A container is comprised of a series of logical APFS volumes, which share blocks from the container. Physical disks combine to form an APFS container. Uh, APFS also allows snapshots, just like a virtual machine. So a couple of places to do some forensic examinations on a Mac is Spotlight, the search feature in Mac OS. It, it has a treasure trove of evidence, including file and app metadata, and it normally stores itself uh, in a dot spotlight v100 store v2 folder. Files that are moved to the trash and then deleted cannot be recovered as the OS no longer maintains a link to reference that file's physical location or in using Apple's terms, the catalog ID no longer exists. The .ds store file contains indication of the files that were moved to the trash. Journaling is an HFS plus feature that maintains a backup of user files so that if a system crashes, the last saved copy of that file will be made available. DMG is an exact copy of a file or a volume and files within can be encrypted. A DMG file in Apple is the equivalent of a DD image that can be viewed as a mountable virtual disk. A sparse image is a virtual file for Mac OS that will grow in size as more files are added. This is usually used for uh, backups. Sparse bundle is like sparse image, but is used with file vault. Uh, finally, uh, plist or property list format files are configuration files, similar to registry files found in Windows. Plist will contain a wealth of information for investigators like user and application preferences. Different from Windows, though, there is a plist for each application, not one plist for all applications, because Windows registry is the second. It is one place where everything throws itself to. Whereas in Mac, every application will have its own little plist. And oh, uh, the sleep image is a, uh, it's basically like a hyperfill, hyperfill file from Windows. It stores the contents of RAM. If the power goes out, this file is read and moved back into active memory. So if you are working on a Mac and the power goes out and you need to do a forensics investigation, we'll grab that sleep dot in or dot sleep image file because that will have what's in memory. Okay. More uh, interesting things about the Mac OS. From the classic Mac OS in 84 with a GUI and a mouse all through Mac OS X today. Having a knowledge of the history and version numbers is important for this specific work, such as uh, Puma was 10.1, released September 2001, or Catalina was replaced October 2019, or Monterey was released uh, October 20, uh, 2021. The information that is in the lecture notes is tied to Catalina because that's when the book was written. Uh, Big Sur and Monterey have come out since. It's kind of the same, a little different as always. Uh, Matt, uh, Apple does changes to their OS uh, with each release. But some things have stayed the same. For example, Gatekeeper, the security feature that enforces code signing for downloaded apps before being executed. Mac OS verifies the developer ID signature to check that the program comes from a recognized developer. 
A file vault is a volume encryption tool. When enabled, there's virtually no helpful evidence that can be retrieved. There is a recovery key that the user is encouraged to save or print. There is also the option to save it with Apple, making contact with Apple a worthy try. There is a disk utility who can do disk functions like verifying, repairing, formatting, mounting. You can also access it in the terminal by typing disk util. Mac OS has its own keychain. It's it, or they call it keychain. It's a password manager. And uh, the location where it stores its keys are in the user's folder under library keychains. There is also an iCloud keychain. Uh, there are tags when looking at a uh, at Finder. Uh, tags are useful or valuable to us as they can demonstrate the personalization and organization of files by a suspect. Safari, of course, has uh, valuable information if it's not deleting information. And a quick note about uh, target disk mode and device cloning. When booting a Mac, discern if a password exists in the firmware by holding the option key at power on. If there is no power, you can press the T key to prevent macOS from loading and see if the drive can be accessed as a mass storage device. If the firmware does have a password, you won't be able to shift target mode and move forward. You have to find another way around. And with, uh, with Apple making all their devices, like the, the storage being soldered on, it means you might have to go back to things like JTAG or chip off to get that data. Even more of a headache if it's all encrypted. So hooray. Similar to macOS, knowledgeable of the mobile device created by Apple and the various nuances of the products is important when investigating. For example, mobile devices can be more beneficial as there is more evidence and more personalized data in mobile devices. Mobile devices are often interconnected in an Apple environment through iCloud. The same evidence can be retrieved from multiple devices. Because of the similarities, there is more predictability about what to expect when investigating these devices. Since Apple is in control of the ecosystem, it can be possible to request user data and assistance from Apple. This is not without its challenges. As Apple encourages users to upgrade to the latest version of iOS, which tends to have significant improvements to security, creating more problems for law enforcement retrieving evidence from devices. Uh, iOS has been formatted in APFS and divides the root partition and media. iOS is encrypted in AES-256 at the block level. The unique device identifier is a 40-digit alphanumeric identifier for every device. It's hard-coded into the application processor along with the group identifier. Apple does not keep a record of this, but it is used to cryptographically link data to a specific device, rendering chip off worthless. Data protection allows the user to receive phone calls, text messages, and emails while the device is locked and decrypting sensitive information. Each time a file is created, data protection generates a new 256-bit key for the file and sends it to the AES engine that is automatically enabled when the passcode is set. USB restricted mode prevents a trusted computer from unlocking iOS. The user is forced to re-enter the password in order to read or write. Every application is encrypted by AES-256 by default. The data used with these applications is also encrypted with the passcode, causing a nightmare for investigators if they don't have it. Many users do not sync their devices with a computer, eliminating the potential to unlock the device using things like a pairing file. 
I will remind you that biometrics is not protected under the law. So if you have touch or face ID enabled on your Apple device, know that law enforcement can legally force you to unlock your device with your face or your fingerprint. So everything that I just uh, noted off could be accessible to an investigator if you have biometrics enabled. If you have only a passcode enabled or a PIN, they cannot force you to unlock, which would make this nightmare real. Yeah, so understand the type of Mac that will be examined. Each model has different ports and will determine the options that you will have available to image the device and whether the hard drive can even be removed. Determining the OS will provide some guidance about what security features the examiner may encounter. The hardware and software running on, on the computer will also impact the, investiga the investigator like the T2 chipset with Secure Vault or File Vault being on or APFS. The FCC ID will help understand the type of device, the hardware, and potentially the software installed. Apple has a checkcoverage.apple.com where investigators can enter a serial number and determine the technical specifications. As you see, uh, encryption is the biggest hurdle that law enforcement will face with Mac devices. Ultimately, you want to obtain a DMG image of the Mac hard drive, and then mount it with read-only forensics tools. Um, chapter 13 has a list of case studies. It's sh it shows you some real examples of of investigations and, and how they apply with all the topics that we've covered in, in the class and that you've read in the book. I didn't find it necessary to go through them in, in the sense of um, it's important for you to know these cases because this isn't a law class. This is an introduction to forensics. So I honestly leave it to you to check out the cases, to read about them if you're interested. But I wouldn't say you have to read them. They're a fun read. Uh, it seemed like watching those videos from that other assignment when you had to watch three uh, people at work in the courtroom. So it's basically similar to that. The last chapter covers a couple of things uh, to just round out everything else. For example, Internet of Things, the internet enabled devices that didn't have internet connection before, but now do. And that could be anything from smart TVs, thermostats, refrigerators. They can be controlled by a smartphone app or remotely controlled. This new field has tremendous potential for investigators. There are many challenges to overcome, such as the tool amount limitation, the vast number of different IoT devices, the non-standard formats, and different proprietary firmware. While many IoT devices cannot be directly forensically imaged, much of the data can be derived by these devices from the cloud. So subpoena for cloud storage can be critical. Case in point, uh, things like IP cameras, don't store information locally, but they do store information at another place, either a disk on the network or up on the cloud. Whereas things like a Raspberry Pi does store, store information in a little SD card, but could also be connected to the cloud. So you gotta do your research 
as to what's happening before you do it. Five G and Wi Fi six, having the right tools and devices to investigate cases using these technologies is important. Again, if you are uh, handling all any kind of situation. If you've never played with Shodan, I highly suggest you do. It's a awesome tool that will help you uh, display video evidence, search for devices that are in a particular area that could help you. Uh, for example, let's say somebody, uh, somebody stole something and you're able to use the uh, system, you're able to use Shodan to find that a nearby camera and see if there's a recording of it or get a at least a subpoena to get information from that camera. Shodan is awesome. Uh, virtual assistants. They're always listening. They could also store information that could be useful. Uh, like Alexa was found, uh, which all the others were too, but just a uh, point finger at Alexa. They're known to record everything and upload to Amazon. So you can get a subpoena for Amazon and say, hey, give us uh, all the records that you have for this device. Um, GoPro cameras, again, are another way to get information from motorists, since that's, you know, that's where they're often used. Uh, examining frame rates in the video and any other evidence can help find out things like um, uh, how fast they were going. Police vehicles. They have a cellular vehicle to everything standard and vehicle to vehicle communication. Uh, this allows cops to be connected to the internet and transmit data using a cradle point router to remotely access fielding blueprints and maps or aerial views with drones, uh, do situational awareness, connect with other departments, doing uh, plate recognition, all that kind of stuff. In that same vein, vehicle forensics is a whole other world as more, more cars have um, it, more complex entertainment systems or infotainment systems. And a lot of their information is now centralized and connected to the internet. But the final thing that I wanna remind you is Getting evidence for an investigation can be done by very low tech, uh, low tech ways. For example, as shown in this picture, some dogs are trained to locate devices that, that have TPPO, a chemical that is found in all devices. So if a criminal thinks, I'm going to hide an SD card with uh, that has my child exploitation images. I'm going to hide it somewhere. The police, after getting a, a warrant and go into the, the place where they think the crime has happened, bring in a dog, sniff around, and the dog could find those hidden um, those like those hidden micro SD cards or whatever. So when it comes to digital forensics, don't solely rely on all things technical. Also remember that low tech solutions are a thing and can be very useful in an investigation. And now for the purpose of the recording, I want to remind you that we are working on the cases. Case number three, as I mentioned on Discord, case number three is now optional and is not required to be done. I 
once again, implore you and highly encourage you to work together. You do not get penalized in my courses for working together. You are encouraged to work together. We have that Discord channel, use it. Talk to one another, help each other out to solve these cases. You have six cases to work on and they are all due on December 7th. No one person should do these alone. I, I believe that these cases are too big for a person to do. But I believe by working together, you should be just fine. As always, if you have any questions, please ask away on Discord. Uh, after this recording, we don't necessarily need to meet on Saturday mornings. I am always available on Discord to answer your questions. To have a fun weekend, Halloween weekend, and I will see you on Discord very soon.